uh, sorry, Acts chapter 2, verses 17 to 21. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Father God, we praise you that through your prophet Joel in the Old Testament, you, uh, he prophesied that you will pour out your spirit. We thank you, Lord, that in Peter's day, he saw that fulfilled. But we thank you, Lord, that this just isn't, isn't just a historical fact that you keep on pouring out your spirit. And we pray that you pour out your spirit on us this morning, Lord, old and young and anyone in between. And especially, Lord, we pray that you'll pour out your spirit on Ian over these next few minutes particularly, that our hearts may be moved and our minds inspired in our walk with you for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Just pray that um, I will not dream dreams over this next half hour or so. <laughs> <laughs> not quite sure how to follow that, but thank you at least for acknowledging your age, David. <laughs> and every time I hear that verse, I, I keep thinking that I'm probably heading more towards the dreaming dreams than the young men seeing visions. But anyway, um, we're going to think a little bit about visions and dreams, but actually more than that, um, what I really felt this morning is that God wants to speak to us. One of the reasons that Jody opened up this morning by saying, let's be listening to God, is I believe that God's going to speak significantly to us, uh, particularly today, but also in this season. And so we want to make room to hear from God. So one of the reasons that I'm starting the preach slightly earlier than we normally would do is because we want to give a longer time later to have some more worship, but to tune in to what God is speaking over us today so that we can respond and pray for one another and also stand together around the Word of God. So if you uh, can get onto a device where you can interact with the live chat, whether that's on YouTube or on the church website, if you can be doing that um, while I'm talking, that will really set you up later for being able to hear from God. And it already, if you're sensing that God is speaking something, do you want to put it on the live chat? And we will use that to agree together over what God's saying this morning, and then to have an opportunity to pray together over what God's speaking over us as restore in this season. And just like Jody was saying, it has been quite an incredible year, this last one, hasn't it? In many ways, I think it's been a brutal year. And I think many of us are feeling the impact of that. We're kind of feeling the, the battering that we've had just by having to deal with the different situations on a day-by-day -day basis. And one of the reasons we've been looking at this current series and uh, we've been calling it Living Water is because it's all about the Spirit of God. Mm -hmm. And we've been looking at John chapter 4, and the reality of the story in John chapter 4 is an ordinary, everyday woman who has been bruised and battered by life comes into the presence of Jesus, and everything changes for her. And I just want to say this morning, if you're feeling bruised and battered, and you're feeling alone, she came to draw water when there was no one else around in the heat of the day, one moment in the presence of Jesus can change everything. And Jesus promises her in the uh, story, in the encounter, he promises her that his life-giving water will flow and will well up like a, like a fountain. And my prayer for us this morning is where we're feeling battered, where we're feeling bruised, that actually Jesus will speak. And as Jesus speaks, that life-giving water will start to spring up like, like a fountain and bring fresh life, bring renewal, bring refreshment to each and every one of us. 
So let's, let's just where you are right now, why don't you just welcome the Spirit of God? Why don't you welcome the Spirit of God? If you can uh, pray in tongues, why don't you pray out in tongues? If, uh, if uh, it helps you to worship, why don't you just worship? Why don't you just speak out the name of Jesus? But let's let the living water of the Spirit of God, let's just let it uh, bubble up right now and bring refreshment and bring healing and bring restoration. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. And what we're thinking about today as we look again at the story uh, from John chapter 4 of of this woman, we're looking at, at the fact that God can do extraordinary things through the most unusual people in sometimes the most challenging situations. Isn't that, isn't that encouraging? God can do the most extraordinary things through the most unusual people in the most difficult situations. And sometimes it's when we come to the end of ourselves that then we really see God at work. And sometimes we have to come to the end of ourselves to then get to the place where we truly, truly reach out or we uh, uh, surrender to the feet of Jesus and then he does something quite extraordinary and the story of the woman at the well is really extraordinary because this woman comes to Jesus and it's full of little holy spirit the whole story is full of little holy spirit moments and so it starts off with Jesus is on a journey and he just feels like he needs to go through Samaria and normally he wouldn't but he just feels he needs to go through Samaria and Hannah and Sammy were talking about the fact we can all hear from God we were all made to hear the voice of God and sometimes the voice of God I don't think God spoke in a great massive voice and said to Jesus you must walk through Samaria I think he just had a sense on the inside do you know what go this way and uh, being available to the Holy Spirit it, being led by the Holy Spirit is just taking those few moments to say God which way shall I go God what shall I do today and he just listened to the inner prompting in his heart and in his spirit and he ended up going through Samaria as he was going through Samaria he ended up sitting at a well while he was sitting at a well this a lady comes up and something within him again I think a prompting from the Holy Spirit just says talk to her And so he begins a story with a a conversation with her. And then in the conversation, God speaks through Jesus. God gives him some revelation. But the woman ends up knowing that she's loved by God, that he cares for her, that he's interested in her and that he has something good for her. And that changes everything. And it's amazing because it seems like an everyday, ordinary situation. But the impact of it is quite extraordinary. And Jesus happens to sit by a well. He happens to talk to an ordinary broken woman. By the end of the story, it says this. It says, so the woman left her water pot, went into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all the things I've done. This is not the Christ, is it? Now, note this. They went out the city and we're coming to him, we're coming to Jesus. Now, those few verses, they make me smile in many ways because John deliberately brings out the fact that she went and spoke to the men of the city. Now, if you know anything about this woman's background, she was the least likely person that the men of the city would listen to. Not only was she a woman and women were second-class citizens in the day of Jesus, thank God Jesus came to turn that around and change it and transform that situation. And we celebrate that. Not only that, the woman had a really broken past and would have had a fearsome reputation and all of the men of the city, their wives, would have wanted to keep them away from this woman. And probably nobody would have believed what this woman said. And yet it's this very woman who goes to speak to the men of the city and says, come meet a man who told me everything about my life. And they were so amazed by the change in this woman that they went out to see Jesus. And it goes on. If we read the next couple of verses, it says, from that city, many of the Samaritans believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified. He told me all the things I've done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they were asking him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. I find it amazing, but so encouraging that one casual encounter that Jesus had with an ordinary everyday woman ended up changing changing the whole uh, life of a town. A whole town came to meet Jesus because one person, one broken, 
wounded, vulnerable person had an engagement with Jesus. And the impact of that went way beyond what anybody could have thought of and imagined. I find that so encouraging. I think for many of us at the moment, we feel broken, we feel empty, we feel dry. But who knows what one encounter with Jesus today might do to bring change and transformation, not just to your life, but to everyone's life, to the wider community that we're a part of. And I think just a couple of things that I felt God was uh, wanting to highlight from this story today. One, the woman's life changed because she knew she was valuable to God. I just want to say to you this morning, I don't know what you're feeling at the moment. I don't know what you're going through at the moment, but know that Jesus knows you and he loves you. And he's interested in being a part of your life right now. Maybe you feel isolated. Maybe you feel at the end. Maybe you feel really discouraged. You're never too far away from the loving Jesus who wants to come and wrap his arms around you and say you're valuable and you're precious to me. Second thing I just want to bring out for a moment from the story is the fact that the village was changed because of the woman's story. She didn't have a degree in theology. She hadn't gone to church for 35 years to come under the excellent teaching of people like me. She hadn't had any of that. Uh, thank you for laughing at that, Jody. Um, she didn't have any of that, but she had the story of a changed life. And it was the story of a changed life that changed other lives. And we all have a story and our story is really powerful. You know, I've been in ministry for a long time now. I've got more gray hairs to, to prove that. Um, but I've, over those years, I've knocked on many different doors. I've talked to many different people about Jesus. I've invited many people along to church through the years. Do you know, the most powerful tool that I've found in talking to somebody else's uh, life is the story of what Jesus has done in my life. You can't argue someone into the kingdom of God. You can't pick up your Bible and beat someone into the kingdom of God. What you can do, though, is say, this is what I've discovered about the goodness of God. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing so powerful than a story of a life that is changed. So don't devalue your story. Don't forget your story. Don't neglect your story. You know, sometimes when I'm in the hardest situations, the most encouraging thing to do is just to sit down and remind myself of how Jesus has proved himself faithful through the years, of the significant moments where I felt his love, the significant moments that he spoke words of value and worth and direction and calling over me. Maybe in this season, the way that the living water will start to flow again in your life is because you just take a moment to sit down and remember all that God has done. And as you remember it, God will refresh and restore and remind, and you'll find faith rise because of it. And actually, when we look through the life of Jesus, what we find is it's full of everyday, ordinary encounters. But because they're spirit breathed, because they're spirit led, the impact of them goes way beyond what you would imagine. Another one of my favorite stories is in Mark chapter five. And it's the story of the Gadarene demoniac. And uh, it's a favorite story of mine for a number of reasons. One is that Jesus gets the disciples, he puts them in the boat and he says, let's go over to the other side of the lake. And the reality is they don't want to go there and they're really terrified about going there. And uh, then a storm uh, brews up and, uh, and the disciples are like, why are you taking us over there? They're absolutely petrified. But when they hold on to Jesus and push through the storm, the other side, there's a massive breakthrough, a massive move of God that happens. I think for some of us today, Jesus is just wanting to remind us that he's in the boat with us. And it might be stormy around us, the waves might be battering us, but he's with us in the boat. And because he's with us in the boat, we do not need to fear. And I believe one of the things that Jesus is saying is the other side of the lake, there's a massive breakthrough. The other side of this pandemic, there's a massive breakthrough. So let's, let's hold on to the presence of Jesus in the middle of our boat. Let's trust him to bring us to the other side, because he will. 
And it's really interesting, when Jesus got to the other side, uh, it, it was almost like the disciples' worst nightmare <laughs> then confronted them, because the first person they met was the most unlikely person to start with to lead a revival, and that was the Gadarene demoniac. And if we look at the verses from Mark chapter 5, this is how it describes him. It says, he had his dwelling among the tombs. No one was able to bind him anymore, even with a chain, because he'd often been bound with shackles and chains, and the chains had been torn apart by him, and the shackles broken in pieces and no one was strong enough to subdue him. Constantly, night and day, he was screaming among the tombs and in the mountains and gnashing himself with stones. It's a really extreme situation. And uh, as I say, the disciples were terrified getting there. I bet when they met this guy, they were really, really terrified. But you know, the amazing thing is when Jesus turns up, this guy falls at his feet Jesus commands the demons out of him. It's a bit of a freaky story because there's a herd of pigs and all the demons fly into the pigs. The pigs go into the water and uh, totally get destroyed. But this man's life is totally transformed because of one moment in the presence of Jesus. And the outworking of this is the whole region is transformed. Why? Because of this man's story of his encounter with Jesus. And actually, it's really interesting because at the end, the whole town is freaked by this herd of uh, pigs going away and being drowned. And so they, they beg Jesus to leave. They say to Jesus, go away. This is too spooky. This is too freaky. You just go away and leave us alone. And this poor man that has been so transformed, he goes to Jesus and he says, please, can I go with you? Please. And Jesus says, no. And it's one of those moments, actually, it always stirs my heart because I think, oh, poor guy, he has to stay. And Jesus says, no, you stay. But he says, you go and tell the people the change that's happened. And what's really interesting is all the people of the region, they say they beg with Jesus to go. This man stays and he starts to tell his story. And just over a chapter later, Jesus returns When Jesus returns at the end of Mark chapter 6, we see the impact of this one man and his story. And the impact is this. Just waiting for Mark 6 to come up on the screen, because then I can read. That's great. When they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him, that's Jesus, and ran about the whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place where they heard he was. Whenever he entered the villages or the cities or the countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces and imploring him that they might just touch the fringe of his cloak. And as many as touched it were cured. Isn't that amazing? That that sounds like revival to me. And it wasn't a big crusade. It wasn't a big meeting with big PAs and everything else. It was one man in a desperate situation who'd walked into the presence of Jesus. And the transformation that came out of that so impacted the people around they came flocking to Jesus and as they flocked to Jesus so they were healed they were set free they were delivered and you know what Jesus is just the same today as he was then and he's able to do just as much today as he did then all we need to do is have a little bit of faith and say Jesus I believe you and in, Mark, in Matthew chapter 13, Jesus uh, talks about his number of parables, one of my favorite ones, but I think it illustrates this point really well, is Jesus says, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all the other seeds, but when it's full grown, it's larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so the birds of the air might come and nest in its branches. And you see the dynamic that Jesus is talking about in the spirit of God. When we step into the kingdom of God, kingdom of God just means where Jesus is at work. When we step into where Jesus is at work, one simple little act of faith, one little mustard seed watered by the spirit of God can become a massive tree. Just like one simple Samaritan woman with one simple conversation with Jesus ended up being the key to a whole community being transformed. Just as one desperate man at the very end in Mark chapter 5, with one simple encounter with Jesus, became the key to transformation of the region. There's no limit on what God might do from one simple act of faith. 
I don't know where you, feel, where you feel you're at at the moment. I think with this uh, last year, it's hard even to get beyond just holding it all together. But you know, one simple act of faith. God is able to water with his living water and it has the power to become huge in terms of its kingdom impact. And in, Mark, in Matthew 13, where Jesus is talking about these parables, the, the two of them are about seed. One is the story of the mustard seed. The other is the parable of the sower. And often when we talk about the parable of the sower, we uh, instantly get to uh, thinking about the soil. And we talk about the different sorts of soil and the fact it's all about the soil of our hearts. And if we're going to grow, then we need to be good soil. I think that's true. I think that's a valid interpretation of the story. Actually, when you put it in context, though, I don't know that that is really what Jesus is trying to teach through that parable. That might be a shocker to some of you, but I'm not sure that is what Jesus is really talking about. Because I think the point of the story is we need to sow and we need to be sowers who keep sowing. And I think what Jesus is saying is, you keep sowing, and I will take care of what comes out the other side. And actually, when you look even at the life of Jesus, some people didn't receive the words that Jesus tried to sow into their lives. Some people began to receive the words that Jesus sowed in their life, but then they gave up, or they got distracted, or it got choked by the worries of the world and the other things that crowded in. But other people became incredible soil, like the Samaritan woman, like the Gadarene demoniac. And that that seed reproduced 30, 60, 100 times. But the key to it was there was seed that was being sown. There was seed that was being sown. And you see, if you want to get a harvest, you have to sow seed. And in the parable of the sower, Jesus says the seed is what? Shout at your TV screen or your iPad or your computer. The seed is what? It's very quiet in here. (laughs) The seed is the word of God. The word of God. So what have we got to sow if we want to be fruitful in any season? We've got to sow the word of God. So what have we got to do? We've got to hear what God is speaking. And if we hear what God's speaking and we agree together around it, it will create a harvest. But if we don't sow, there'll be no harvest. Which is why it's so important that we get hold of the fact that we can all hear from God... And actually, we need to hear from God because that's the seed in our hands that we then sow to see the kingdom of God come. I'm going to invite the musicians to come back now um, because this morning, what I felt that God wanted us to do is I felt that God wanted us to hear from him afresh. And I believe that God's going to speak words to us today that are going to be seed that we're going to be able to sow in this season. And, And God is going to produce amazing fruit from it. But the starting point is to make sure we've got seed to sow. I went to the shops late yesterday, to Debden Broadway, and I bought some seeds. I didn't try and find some mustard seeds, because I don't think they sell it, but I've got some poppy seeds. Um, and if mustard seeds are really small, they must be really, really small, because these poppy seeds are tiny. But Jesus said just one of these... I've got three there. (laughs) Just one of these is able to produce a massive harvest. And I believe this morning, God wants to put seed in our hands. That we can sow in prayer, that we can agree together for the kingdom of God to come. And I believe there's, uh, there's three sorts of seed that God wants to put in our hands today. Number one, there's some words that God is going to speak in this next little while that's going to bring life transformation to some of us watching. Just like the Samaritan woman, just like the Gadarene demoniac, there's going to be words that's going to bring healing, deliverance, change, transformation, because we're going to tune in to what God is speaking. Secondly, I believe that God is speaking some words over us as a church. We're not individuals, we're part of a community of believers. And I believe there's words that God wants to speak over restore in this season. And as we tune in to God over the next 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I believe God's going to speak some words over our common life as a church. I believe it's going to be seeds that we're going to pray over and water over and sow to see a harvest come. The third thing is I think for some of us, actually God's given us the seed in the past. We've already had the words. 
And God's wanting us to, wanting to remind us of those words. I'm often um, stirred by Psalm 126 that talks about those who sow in tears will reap with joyful shouting. And for some of us, this last year has been a year of many tears. It's been a year of many griefs. It's been a year of many losses. I believe that God is saying if we sow in a season of grief, in faith, there will be a harvest that will come from it. What you must, must, must never do is just cry. Cry and sow something in faith. Cry and sow something in faith. Your tears may be the water it will take for that seed to germinate. That's okay. Every seed needs some water to germinate. If my tears are what needs to be sown for the seeds that God's put in my heart to germinate, let my tears come. But if I just cry, I've got nothing. God, in this brokenness, in this pain, may you glorify Jesus. God, in this adversity, may you use it to make me more like Jesus. God, in this loss, may I understand more what it is to carry a heart of compassion and a heart that is yielded to you. Do you know, in every heartbreak, in every situation, we can bring it to Jesus and he's able to bring something from it. But we need to let the tears water the seed so the fruit can come. We're going to take a few moments now and I've uh, got the band back. We're going to worship. We're going to invite the Holy Spirit to come. But I want you, now, maybe you just want to sit there and let the Holy Spirit, let the living water just wash over you. But can I encourage you, open your ears and say, God, what are you speaking to me today? God, what are you speaking to us today? And when you hear a word, put it on the live chat. Maybe it's a word that someone else needs to hear this morning. Maybe it's a word that's going to bring healing and transformation, just like the word to the Samaritan woman or the Gadarene demoniac. Maybe it's a word that's going to bring freedom and encouragement to someone else. Maybe it's a word that God's speaking over us as restoring this season. But let's tune in, and when you get it, then put it on the live chat. We're going to be listening to the word of God here in Woodford as well. And uh, then as we continue in worship, we're going to have an opportunity to respond to and pray over these words. So I'm just going to pray, and then the musicians will uh, take over and lead us through this uh, journey. Lord, I thank you that you are God who speaks. Thank you the whole of creation was started with a word. And Lord, thank you that you never stopped speaking. Thank you the Samaritan's life was transformed because you spoke to her. And Lord, I pray in these moments, in this silence right now, will you come and speak to us? Father, we we quieten all the other voices and we tune in and we say, Lord, may you speak by your spirit to us. Lord, what is the word? What is the seed that you're wanting us to receive and pray over and water in this season so that fruit might come? Now, the musicians are going to lead us in worship. As I say, just, let's just welcome the Holy Spirit and when you get a sense of God speaking something, saying something, put it on the live chat and we'll respond to it. I love it because whenever we invite God to speak, um, he speaks. Shouldn't be surprised by that, should we? Because he's a loving father and a great father, he speaks to us. And so I just want to read some of the words that God is speaking, some of the seeds that God is speaking over us today. And then we're going to pray into some of them. If you're watching this on catch up, do you know God's still able to speak? And some of these words might be right for you as you watch this. God is not time bound in the way that we often are. So um, I see a crawling baby crying. He looks for his mother and she picks him up and holds him close. We can be the crying baby and Jesus picks us up. I believe when I was speaking I felt like there really is a wave of grief that's hit a number of people uh, through this last season but maybe particularly in the last week or two and I believe Jesus is saying um, come to me with your grief 
and I will pick you up and I will hold you close. And actually there was a word that, uh, that came straight after that saying that God is saying that when we're hurt, he is hurt. But when we rejoice, he rejoices with us and he wants to bring joy in our lives. And I believe God was saying, if you're experiencing grief right now, come to me, let me pick you up, let me hold you on my breast, just like a, a mother does to a, a baby. But as you find that place of safety and security and nestling, then I'm gonna take away your tears and I'm gonna replace it with joy. But the key is coming close and responding. So if that's you, let's just in invite Jesus to come close. And maybe just where you are, you just wanna imagine yourself just resting on the chest of Jesus, just resting in the love of Jesus. And let him comfort you in your grief. Let the tears be washed away. Let Jesus bring renewal and restoration. So uh, another word from Chris Harding about the fact that God often works in ways that we don't expect. And it, that's so, so true. Quite often we, we have in our minds how God's going to work in the next season and we uh, come up with that picture because of our history and our experience of how God's worked. But actually when God is doing something new, it always comes in a new form and it always comes in a new format and it's about, um, it, it's about inviting God, surrendering to God in the new, even though it doesn't look like we expect it. And for some of us, there's a reshaping that needs to happen. Some of the breaking, I think, is because God wants to build us differently in the future, but we need to cooperate with him through the season of breaking so then he can form the new stuff. And there is something about letting our comfort zones and our securities go, which is uh, part of Chris's word, letting the way that we think things ought to be done, letting that go, surrendering to that, and trusting that Jesus will bring something new into this next season. Um, and a picture from Gav, he's obviously been on holiday to Iceland in the past, uh, not just the supermarket, I think actually the country. Um, but Gav writes, I have a picture of a massive lagoon of bubbling water. It's freezing cold outside, causing lots of distress and pain to the people on the edges. Some people start jumping in and immediately start shouting with joy due to the warmth they get and start encouraging people on the edges to jump in. That's a word to say, let's jump into Jesus in this season. Let's jump into the bigness of God. Let's jump into the goodness of God. You might be feeling bruised. You might be feeling cold. You might be feeling lonely on the outside. Let's jump into the presence of God. Hester, I don't think that God's forgotten his promises he made to you long ago. He will keep his promises. His timing is perfect. George, I, I believe Jesus wants to encourage us as a church that he believes in us to be the vessel that he can use to demonstrate his power and love in this world. We were created for a time like this. No one is a mistake and we have great purpose in this time, this season of life. Our identity and destiny is secured in Jesus. Little children, you are of God and you belong to him. I feel it's really significant that he's picked up this verse, little children. I think for some of us, we feel very vulnerable. We feel very small. But Jesus says, little children, you are of God. You belong to him and you've overcome them because of he who's in you, who's greater than he that is in the world. We are overcomers, not because of our strengths, not because of our bigness. We're overcomers because of the bigness of Jesus. Hmm. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. just want to pray over us this morning. There's, there's more words appearing I can't read them all uh, in time or keep up with them. But uh, Lord Jesus, thank you that you're speaking right now. Mm. And Lord, we want to respond to the words that you're saying, Lord. We want to respond to what you're speaking over us as a church. Father, in our pain, Lord, where we maybe can identify with that little baby that's crying, Lord, we welcome a father's love. We welcome a mother's embrace. We welcome you picking us up and resting us on your chest, on your breast, and we welcome your love afresh, bringing healing and bringing transformation. And Father, in this season, Lord, we surrender what we have known. We surrender what we've been comfortable with. Father, where you've taken us out of our comfort zone, Lord, we yield at a deeper level to you. And we say we trust you for the future. We trust you for the reforming that you're doing in this season. We trust you for the new wineskin that we're going to come out with 
as a, as a church and maybe in the way that we operate, we trust you for the new. We trust you for the new. And Father, where we are uh, feeling vulnerable, Lord, Lord, thank you even though we're vulnerable, even though we're little children, Lord, thank you we're not powerless because you are with us. Thank you that you are greater than he that is in the world. You are greater than, than our adversary. You are greater than every circumstance around us. And Father, we put ourselves into the bigness of Jesus. We put ourselves into the victory of Jesus right now, right now, right now. And Lord, I pray that faith will arise across Restore right now. Father, I release faith right now. I release the gift of faith. I release the gift of faith. I say, let faith arise. Let faith arise. Let faith arise. May faith arise. May faith in the bigness of God. May faith in the word of God. May faith in the power of God. Let faith arise right now. Right now. Let supernatural, spirit-filled faith arise. In Jesus' name. Just as we've been resting in him and praying and worshipping, I just had the sense of a phrase, don't give up. And it's for uh, two different pictures for it. One, um, just God saying, I see you. I really see you and don't give up. And I saw a picture of a kangaroo putting their joey into their pouch. And I think specifically this person really likes kangaroos. I think it's just one of those things God wants to say. Like, this is a picture. I really do know you. And I'm saying, don't give up and abide in me. Kind of that, that rest, that kind of that word abide, kind of the, the way the joey goes in the pouch for the kangaroo. But abide in me, dwell in me, remain in me. Stay with me. So I just want to pray over you this morning. May you know God's grace towards you to remain in him. Know that you are loved and you are seen this morning. And then the other picture I had was um, in a forest, kind of on a log, uh, there was kind of someone sat there, uh, pretty tired and worn out and again, just resigned, I guess, to the situation. And there was a bow and arrow um, just by their feet. And just that encouragement to pick, up, pick it up again. And as, as I saw this person pick up the bow and arrow again, I was reminded of the, of the 2 Kings 13 passage that we did a series on a couple of years ago of, about the arrows and about striking the ground. And it speaks into what Ian was saying about taking the words, and I'm just going to pick up one of these seeds, but taking the word that God has spoken over you in the past. He's a promise keeper. Don't give up. Don't, don't be resigned to the fact that it hasn't happened yet. Hold on to that word and pick up your bow and arrow again. And the thing about the arrows, it's about the word of God and that striking the ground until it happens and, and praying. And that's the small thing we do. Just to, to pick up that word again and to pray over it again and again and again. To trust God that he is the way maker, the light in the darkness, the promise keeper. He doesn't go back on his word. And so why don't you this morning in this, as we carry on worshipping, Kind of take that word that God has spoken over you in the past that you've kind of laid down and just resigned yourself to the fact that it's not going to happen or it's just too tiring waiting for it. And maybe you want to write it down afresh for you on a piece of paper or write it in the live stream if you want to so people can pray with you and stand with you over your arrows. I want to encourage you to pick up that word again. God is a promise keeper. So I want to pray for you as well this morning. Lord, thank you that you sing over us. And Lord, you speak to us and you, you give us words and promises of what's to come. And Father, I pray that as we, in our tiredness, we pick up those words again, Lord, that, that's kind of that, that step, that sowing, that picking up, Lord, that you would fill us with refreshment once more with your word, Lord, that you, you would refresh our tired bones, uh, Lord, you'd refresh our tired spirits and you would drench us in your spirit again, Lord, that as we pick up that word, there'd be a rising of faith that we were just praying about, there'd be a rising of faith that you are the promise keeper. And so, Lord, we want to say we trust you with this word. We pick up our bow and arrow again. We say, Lord, would you come? Thank you that all your promises are yes and amen in Christ Jesus. And we hold on to the promises of God. We 
hold on to your promises, onto your words that you've spoken over each one of us, that you've spoken over this church. Refresh us. Give us new fervour to, to pray over these words once again.